Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together uh, the the epistle, uh, 1 Corinthians. And I've already pointed out to you that the that Corinth really wasn't the, the greatest uh, example or the greatest city in the world, morally speaking. And uh, apparently uh, there were problems in the church. You know, as we go through the epistle, we'll find out what those problems were. But uh, in this first chapter, uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, not the author, not the human author, not Paul, but the Holy Spirit has done nothing but stress the sovereignty of God. Uh, we're going to go here to our text. Uh, uh, King James Version. And uh, Paul was called an apostle. Uh, he didn't choose to be that. Uh, God chose him to be an apostle. Uh, verse 4, the uh, grace of God, which, was, uh, which has been given. Uh, verse 5, uh, that in everything you come behind in no gift and no spiritual graces, that's plural. Uh, these are all things that are true of the New Testament believer in Christ. Uh, we saw some amazing things. Uh, verse 8, that God will confirm you to the end, you know, which is a major concern on the part of most Christians I meet today, who, who shall also confirm you un, unto the end, blameless blameless uh, that's uh, verse 8 in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ God is faithful the emphasis is on his faithfulness not our own by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son uh, it's interesting that's a uh, I think we take fellowship for granted, or many of us don't quite have uh, a firm grasp on what God's desire for us is and the provision that he's made for that, that fellowship can occur. Uh, it's wrong to assume that we're not worthy of that fellowship when that fellowship is based on the principle of grace. That ought to be comforting and great news to you folks. Uh, so he's writing to a church that it's really lost its moral compass. It's, it's morally corrupt, and yet God calls them blameless. Uh, verse 9, uh, called, you know, by God into fellowship with his son. Uh, he's faithful. Uh, God is faithful. The text clearly says that he's faithful. Uh, not ourselves. We were called into the fellowship of his son. And so were these believers at Corinth. Uh, we go down to verse 17. Uh, right here, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ uh, should be made of no effect. Uh, verse 17, was, uh, he was sent by Christ. He didn't send himself. He was sent by Christ. Saved, that's a passive voice here in uh, uh, for the preaching of the cross in verse 18, is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are, are saved. That's not redeemed, that's saved. That's a passive voice. Saved them that believe. God's doing that. It pleased God to do that. It, it pleased God to save them that believe God. He, he's doing that. Uh, verse 19, uh, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing uh, the understanding of the prudent. I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise. 
in verse 20. Uh, it is God who made foolish the wisdom of the world. Uh, verse 21. Uh, well, what we see there in verse 21 is uh, it pleased God by the foolishness. It pleased God. It actually pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe, and again, that's not redeemed, that's that's delivered, that's rescued, delivered from guilt, delivered from the burden of sin. Uh, but it, it's, it pleased God by the foolishness of the proclamation to save those who believe. Verse 22, uh, we saw that, uh, well, the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after, seek after wisdom. Uh, so, uh, the Jews require a sign. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Uh, for the Jews, it's a stumbling block. And there's an interesting word there in the original text I want to talk about. Uh, the Greeks, uh, the foolishness, uh, uh, their wisdom is foolishness. Now, why? Why is that? It's because God ordained it that way. We've seen nothing but the sovereignty of God here, folks. Not It's not because they have some peculiar characteristic. And, uh, and uh, Greeks, I think that means non-Jews. Non-Jews. And they, that can be taken as Gentiles, verse 27. Uh, called and chosen in verse 27. Uh, called and chosen. He chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God decreed, God said he did these things in order that no flesh would glory in his presence. Uh, that's, that's basically the last verse of the first chapter. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, and dearly beloved, what are you going to do with the words? But of him are ye in Christ Jesus. The text doesn't say it's of you that you're in Christ Jesus. It is of him that you are in Christ Jesus. And if you follow this channel, you know where we stand on the matter of life preceding faith. Uh, we had to be alive. We had to be born again, made uh, uh, alive in order to believe because clearly Christ says that his sheep will believe. And the reason that they believe is because they're his sheep. Uh, they don't become his sheep uh, by believing. And that's where much of modern Christianity has become mixed up and messed up. Uh, that according as it is written, that's a, that's a quote from Jeremiah chapter 9. Uh, it's a partial quote. Here's the Holy Spirit quoting himself, uh, but not completely. He's, he's taken a part of a verse from Jeremiah 9 uh, that deals with Israel. And uh, let him glory in the Lord. Folks, of course God is sovereign. All right? I mean, think about that, that 18th verse here for a moment. It's the 18th verse. For the preaching of the cross is uh, to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. Uh, just think about that. You know, if the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, then why preach it? Why preach it? I mean, who wants to preach to... Uh, to people who, by God's sovereign decree, are perishing. I don't think that any one of you could sit there and, and tell me that, they're, they, that they chose to perish. Uh, they're perishing. Why are they perishing? Well, because God decreed it. That's a hard pill to swallow, but that's what the text says. They didn't choose to 
to perish. That was that whole idea was made up by man's drive to somehow convert the world. You're not going to convert the world in the design of God. Those who are perishing will never change. They will never change. From that, they are perishing. They will perish. And uh, there are those who are being saved. And there's no doubt but that they'll be saved. The text leaves no doubt there. Uh, missionaries, you know, uh, tired, uh, discouraged, you know, you preach and you preach and you preach and you don't see any results. And that's, that's a pro that's the problem with a lot of modern day preaching, uh, today, you know, you want to see results, you know, if your church isn't growing, and this is a very, very sensitive topic for me here, you know, given this online ministry. If it isn't growing, if it isn't converting people, then, then there's something wrong with it. You know, and we measure, you know, we, we measure it by the, the, not by the truth of what's spoken, you know, but, but by how many come and, and, and how much money there is and how big it gets and all the other criteria which is not biblical. Our responsibility is not to build a big congregation. I mean, my responsibility and yours is to teach truth. It's up, it's up to God who hears the truth. We can't say, well, you know, I don't like the way those mission, missionaries preach or I don't like the way that that, that minister, that pastor preaches, you know, poor brothers and sisters couldn't cut it, okay? You know, his sheep, listen, his sheep will hear because he said that they would. And so what matters is what it is that we are preaching. What matters is what's preached. There are those who are perishing. There are those who are being saved. And we, from a, a human standpoint, a standpoint of human wisdom, we can't do anything. But God can, and he does. He does do that. It's it's not, well, he's, he's powerless without us. He does do that. We cannot convert. We cannot sanctify. We cannot redeem. We cannot save ourselves, much less others, except through the we take heed unto doctrine, for in doing so we save ourselves and them that hear us. But it's God that does the work, not us. Okay? Twice we see that the text says that they're perishing. We're being saved. Those that believe in verse 21 here. Uh, uh, the ones that are doing the, the believing are the ones that he's saving. And remember the saved up in, in verse 18. Uh, right here, verse 18, the saved there are already believing. And we have scripture declaring, my sheep hear my voice. Why do you not believe me? Christ said, because you're not my sheep. And, and I don't see how people pass over that without giving it a thought. Dearly beloved, the indispensable requirement to believe God is to already be one of his sheep. So the, the proclamation of the gospel is to deliver them that are believing. And those are the only ones. Somebody uh, asked me years ago, uh, asked me one time, you know, well, Steve, to whom are you addressing a message? Well, uh, anybody, uh, everybody, uh, to the air. I'm preaching to the air, okay, because, you know, that's what I do, and I, and I leave that to the Holy Spirit. Only those who are his will believe the truth. 
I can't change that. And neither can you make anyone who's not God's believe the truth. You can't, no matter how bad you want to. Now, that's the hard, cold fact of the matter. You can't do that. That's not your responsibility. It's the preaching, the proclamation of the gospel, the, the message of the cross. You know, that's Christ, his person, and his work that saves them that believe. That's what God delights in doing. Uh, them that are already his. We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, that, and, and that is a death trap, okay? The stumbling block, okay? You'll find that this interesting. If you look at the original word in the, the, the Greek text, uh, uh, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but of them who are the called, you know, and I think that's our third called by God, those are the only ones. To those who are the called, Jews and Gentiles, Christ, God's power, Christ, God's power, Christ, the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God. And that is contrasted with the foolishness of the wise. And, and I'm going to suggest that that refers to, that's both scientifically as well as, I believe, theologically and philosophically and, and every other thing. But this is a church context, and I want to keep you to keep that in mind. Uh, should we consider it foolish, you know, like they do, that God provided for a people of his own, that God had a family of his own, that he provided for those, and, and, and they're the only ones that are called? I mean, if we could get that in our mind, it makes a big difference on how we teach this book. The dominant Christian practice of preaching today is always the sense of responsibility uh, that we have to convert people. And if we don't present it right, if we don't make it attractive enough, if we uh, don't invite them in, if we don't go out and lasso them and drag them in uh, or beat them over the heads with our Bible, you know, or in such things as that, you know, that they're going to go to hell. You know, but we lost the chance to save a poor man's soul. This poor guy, he was under conviction and, and he didn't accept Jesus Christ. He went out, he got killed in a car wreck. And he missed the opportunity to go to heaven, and boy, if I had told him, then maybe he would have, and so on and so forth. All that human logic goes. That's human logic. That's the wisdom of the world. That's not the wisdom of God. That's, that's all human reasoning. God's sheep are God's sheep, and, it's, and it is God's design that... It is the preaching, the foolishness of the thing proclaimed. Amazing. To deliver those who believe. Verse 25, because the foolishness of God uh, right here is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. And folks, I don't. I, I don't. I really don't want to get into into a, a detailed study of Greek grammar. You know, first of all, I'm not qualified to do so. But it is interesting that if you look at these genitives in the original text, that the uh, the word there, this word for foolishness. Let's see if I can get this. Uh, let's go to the interlinear. We're, this is the Greek text. I'll try to enlarge this a little bit. Uh, the word foolish here in the text, right here. Uh, maybe you can see the mouse. The The actual Greek word right here is, uh, is, is moron. I, and I can't make that up. That's 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 how it's pronounced. 
uh, moron in the Greek. Foolish, but it is a, uh, it's a neuter. And, you know, I mean, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer when it comes to Greek grammar. But uh, it doesn't agree in person with the genitive God and the weakness there. The weakness of God. Um, the, uh, the weakness of God. Right here. This here. Uh, this is also, you know, this weakness. That is, uh, that one's also neutered. This is also neutered. And if we, so if we were fair with the text, the genitive would say God's foolishness is wiser than men. And, uh, God's weakness is stronger than men. Yeah, God's foolishness is wiser than men. God's weakness is stronger than men. But God isn't weak. And so to be fair to the grammar, I mean, if we look at the, the neuter here in both places, both places, foolish and weakness, if we look at that neuter in both of those cases, that which appears to be foolish from God's standpoint is wiser than men. And that which appears to be weak from man's standpoint is stronger than men. And keep in mind that what is in view here, okay, what's in view is the cross of Jesus Christ, the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross. Of Jesus Christ. The cross of Christ. For Christ sent me not to baptize, to identify, as I pointed out, but to preach the gospel not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made uh, of none effect. None effect. Who did Jews look for? Well, we know they looked for a man who was going to deliver them from the slavery that they were in, uh, deliver them from Rome, the Roman rule. Uh, they boasted, uh, you know, to Christ. They said, well, we, we've never been enslaved to anybody, to any man. And they'd been enslaved from the days of Babylon to, uh, well, onward. Uh, so I don't know how they could have said that, but they looked forward to a uh, reigning monarch, you know, you know, we we sure we sure hope Jesus, you know, would redeem Israel. How did they expect him to redeem? I mean, how did they expect Israel to be redeemed? You know, apparently they they had some. Uh, concept of uh, surely they had some concept of sacrifice and, and all that I mean uh, surely that they had some concept of redemption the paying of a, of a price they should have seen that they should have seen from the law that it was God who was going to provide this lamb that God was going to uh, he was going to see the suffering of his soul uh, the travail of his soul and be satisfied uh but they didn't see uh, they didn't see the suffering of the soul of a lamb. So how could God be satisfied? You know, and that's I, I suppose that's kind of how they thought. And so, but you know, but they should have recognized that, but they didn't. Our you know our Messiah, the Jews would have said, you know, he well he's not a criminal. You know, uh, uh, surely the Messiah couldn't, he couldn't be a criminal because he couldn't be convicted in a court of law, you know, and crucified. And that, folks, that is a death trap. In verse 23, 
right here. Uh, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. Uh, the word stumbling block there in the original text, uh, I'll go ahead and show this to you. I, again, we're going back into the, the Greek interlinear. I'll try to enlarge this just a little bit. It makes it a little easier for you to see. Uh, this word here, uh, skandalon, that's where we get our word scandal. It's a, it's a stumbling block. If, if we look at that in Strong's, if we look at that word there, what we see is it's basically, you know, I feel like if you're trying to catch a rabbit and you make a, 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 a trap and, or some kind of a small animal trap and you've got a stick that's holding up something, you know, and the stick, you know, he springs the trap and it's, you know, it's a death trap. It's uh, really, uh, if you look on the screen, screen here the definition is a stick for bait of a trap generally a snare so it was a death trap now what's interesting about this i mean because that's what the word means all right is uh that's what the word means Uh, but, uh, these Jews, they couldn't accept that. I mean, uh, nobody, uh, nobody back then could accept that. No Jew would ever, ever entertain, you know, such thoughts unless the, the sovereign God intervened, uh, which he did, you know, unless they were, uh, the called, unless they were one of those that, that believed, unless they were one of those who were being saved like Paul. Paul, the human author of the very epistle we're studying. Uh, Paul from his uh, you know, his education and he was a highly educated Jew as most of you probably are, are well aware of. Paul didn't accept it. I'm, I mean, uh, it was God who had to strike him down on the road to uh, uh, Damascus. You know, and, and and I heard a minister tell me. I had, I had one say one time, you should you should realize that the first question that Paul ever asked to, to uh, is is God, what you, what do you want me to do? And that's far from the truth. The first question that Paul asked was Lord who are you and that's the that's the big question did you get that who are you and the Jews couldn't accept the fact that their redeemer would be uh, someone somebody that would be a, con, a convicted criminal and die on the cross the Jews were convinced that their system of law was so good that an innocent person couldn't be found guilty when the grace that we have now received reveals the love of God that's that's so great, so wonderful, so tremendous, he he declares us to stand blameless. With it. He says we stand before him blameless, before him in love. I mean, that's... Dearly beloved, we can't, we can't be proven guilty any more than our Lord could have been proven guilty. That's it's because, only because... Yeah, you know, I'm not saying we were not a sinners. I'm saying that, that was only because he died in our place. And we're called saints. But just for the record, just so you know that back then during Jesus' time, it was very hard to convict someone and, and put them to death. Uh, and I understand there were a lot of crosses and a lot of death crucifixions, but it was hard to convict that person legally. Uh, so if you were a citizen of Israel, and uh, if you were a Jew, the fact that uh, that Jesus Christ was convicted and died on the cross, uh, to you, that was a death trap. Uh, scan, scandalizo is, I believe, scandalon. Uh, it's a trap set to trap an animal. And who set that trap? Who set the trap? 
Who set the trap? Well, God did. God designed it to be something that the Jews couldn't see. And thank God he did. Okay, if Christ had come down from the the, the cross in, in all of his glory and power, that's, well, that's just, that's exactly what they would have wanted. You know, that would have been a simple thing for Christ to do. I mean, shoot, he could have done that with a blink of his eye, of his eye, an eye just a, you know, a wave of his, uh, well, I guess he couldn't wave his hand. His hand would have been fastened, but just the mere thought, he could have thought that, had that thought and come down. It would have been easy for him to do but it wouldn't have done any good for you. You and I wouldn't be redeemed. Christ was not there to impress these people. He was there to die in the place of his own. Unto them which are the call. Unto them which are the call. So, you know, what appears to be God's foolishness is power, and what appears to be weakness is wisdom. And it's the Greeks and the Gentiles who are not called, who see the cross of Christ as foolish. They, it's ridiculous to them. You get into any kind of discussion with those who are anti-God, anti-Scripture, anti-Bible, you know, uh, they're, they are fully persuaded, absolutely, 100% convinced that, that what they're saying is true and that you are an idiot. Uh, that we believe in foolishness. I'm thrilled to death, folks, that God didn't make it necessary for you to understand the the general theory of relativity in order to be redeemed, in order to get to heaven. I'm thrilled that he didn't make it mandatory that you understand this book to, in order to be his child. And I'm more than thrilled that you had nothing to do with your being his child. So what modern Christianity relishes in, uh, what the message that they adore, is, is to me something that I, I would shudder to think, really, truly. I mean, I would, if that, if that were true, that we had to do something in order to become God's child, then we have major theological problems as we move through the text. I don't want to throw around labels, okay? I'm not interested in... in comparing Arminianism with Calvinism and, and so on and so forth. You know, Reformed theology with, you know, uh, basic mainstream Protestant Arminian theology. I, I'm not interested in labeling, okay? I am of Paul, I am Peter, I'm of, you know, I'm, I'm of Steve, I'm of, I'm of Spurgeon, I'm of, you know, Billy Graham, I'm of, of, of you name it, Joyce Myers, whatever. Floats your boat, all right? Uh, it's not about that. It's, it's not about that. It's not about any of that. I've mentioned this before. I believe everything that God wants us to know is in this book. The question is, are we preaching the truth? Are we preaching the gospel? And I think going through the scriptures verse by verse is a very good way to, to find out it, whether or not you are, in fact, in line with Scripture, or if you're falling in step with much of modern preaching today. Uh, you believe, uh, and you're called for one reason and one reason only, and that's because your Heavenly Father, loving you from eternity past, with an everlasting love that never changes, ordains you to be his child. You know, I, I don't have many Christians I talk to that they, they reach they reach a point uh, in life where that they're they're just totally discouraged, totally despondent, burdened with the sins that they've committed and the things that they've done. Oh, I don't see how the Lord could love me or forgive me for everything I've done. 
I don't know how many times I've heard that. I, I wonder how many who quote the verse really believe that it's God who is working in you both the will and do of his good pleasure. Did he lie, folks, or did he not? Uh, you know, I had a horse. Many of you know this. I had a horse here over, not too long ago, a few several years ago, put me in an ambulance. You know, one time that led to surgery and re rehabilitation. Uh, you know, he, uh, the, you know, horse reared up and slipped on gravel, uh, fell back on top of me, all 1,100 pounds. It was, you know, it was his fault or it was mine. I, you, we could argue that depending on how you look at it. But I believe without one shadow of a doubt that my heavenly father loves me with an everlasting love and he's working in me both the will and the do of his good pleasure did he know did God know that shattering four of the nine bones in my wrist to dust the surgeon said it was the worst he had ever saw did he know that that would hurt well of course he did I doubt that it's that it's possible for you to suffer anything that God doesn't suffer along with you in. He's there. He knows. He knows what's best for you. Uh, we don't. He knows what's best for me. He, he's my God. And what appears to, to people who don't know him and who don't trust his word, what appears to be pure foolishness, nonsense and weakness is in fact something God has by design used for those who are his. You know, that horse wreck that I had, it was, was no different than Israel rejecting her Messiah. You know, we want to blame Israel and we want to, you know, and many do, many do. Folks, God ordained it. The horse and I, you know, both both of us might have been to blame. I personally think it was more the horse than me. Horse, more his fault than mine. But that's another subject. But God ordained that these things come to pass is my point. And that includes everything that happens in your life. If he didn't, then folks, we worship a God of chance. No different than those who believe the cross is foolishness. You see your calling, brother. It's your calling, not something that you did. None of us could possibly sit back and say, you know, I am so glad that I accepted Jesus Christ. You know, I would have been going to hell if I hadn't done that. If you had... Think about that. Think about that for a moment. You know, how, how, how interesting heaven would be if that was the case. You know, how in the world did you ever get here, Tom? I mean, you know, I was, never thought you'd make it. And everybody there would be looking at everybody else trying to, to decide what they did that merited their entrance into the gates of heaven. But you know and I know that that is... That seems to be the the attitude of modern Christianity. That he, heaven has has something to do with what you do. When we ought to realize that our relationship with God has everything to do with what He did. That's the stumbling block. That's the snare. That's the trap. You know, so it's easy to sit back, I guess, and say, you know, I, I've messed up so, so much. I've ruined my life. There's no way God could love me. I, I've sinned more than anybody else ever did. But if that's the way that you feel, I got to wonder if you even read this book. God declares that he loves you with an everlasting love. You see your calling, brethren. Who did he call? Who did he call? 
all of you who are living a good life. And somebody says, well, Steve, you know, you must admit that God, God likes the person who tries better than the person who doesn't. No, no, I don't believe that. Why did God call the way that he did? Because if he called only the high, the wise, the mighty, the noble, then, then that would have reinforced our convictions that the one who really work at it get the prize. It would be helping, assisting the, the narrative, the false narrative that salvation is based on merit. It, that's the way that it is in every aspect of human life. Folks, you know, you know what I know. it In the real world, promotion, getting ahead is based on performance. That's just the way that we were raised. That's the way we run business. That's the way we look at our lives. Am I to believe that I shouldn't help somebody? You know, because it's, well, you know, I want to help them, but man, they got their, their self in that mess. It's their fault. Why should I help them? I mean, it's, all, it's their own fault that they're in the mess that they're in, you know? Folks, I don't have enough intelligence to know whether or not it's, it's their fault or not. My God told me to work with my own hands in order that I might have to give to him that hath need. That's what he said. Not question whether the person is deserving of help or not. The fact that he called these people ought to make it apparent to us that it is not of works. It's not of works. It's of grace. You see your calling brethren. If we're not one of the called, we're not one of the brethren. I mean, look, not many of the, not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, the text says, not many noble are among the called. And if you don't want to be listed uh, among that group, well, that's basically too bad because you were. But, but I, I mean, you know, you're in a pretty sad group here, okay, of people. I don't know, you know, it's as a Facebook group, you know, if you listen. How about somebody out there start a face group, uh, Facebook group of all the the outcasts and all the dregs of society? And the, I, I have had more than one person tell me, Steve, let's be logical. I mean, let's, let's just use the common sense that God gave us. If God's going to save anybody... You know, he's got to save me. That's, that argument's been presented to me several times over the years, particularly when I was in the scholastic environment. That's not what he called. Start a Facebook group of, of the ones that he called and see how many people want to join. We're sinners, but we're not called sinners. We're called saints. We're not called to be saints. We're called saints. We've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. We are, but we're not the cream of the crop. Okay, we're not the best employee. We're not the greatest scientist. We're not the greatest preacher. Even we're not those who who are uh, you know we're not we don't make up that that parcel of that group of individuals that are that's shaping the thinking of the modern world and we're not you know of all the people who worked on that atomic bomb back you know in the 1940s you know they blew, they tested the first one at in new mexico trinity site out there you know the one that the, the only one that ever even mentioned god was einstein did you know that the story goes that that he uh, asked everybody in a class who believed that there was a god to, to stand up and a bunch of them did, and he said, everybody's sitting down as a fool. And then he began his lecture. These were brilliant minds. You know, we'll never know all that these people knew. But they didn't know God. 
And then we come to find out that these many of these physicists and these, you know, great mathematicians, these uh, nuclear physicists and, you know, who were the cream of the crop before the first bomb was, was set off, they're praying. They're on their knees praying. Actually praying that, that their their calculations were, were were correct, that their math was correct, so that they didn't, you know, wouldn't destroy the entire world. You know, they had enough confidence in their math, at least, you know, to go ahead with the explosion. I think if I'd have been there, I'd, I didn't saw that, I'd have, I would have probably asked, you know, well, who are you praying to? You know, if you teach me in a class that there's no God, and then, and then you kneel to pray to a God, I, I don't understand that. So God didn't call many. He didn't call many wise, mighty, noble. He did call some but not many. And it's easy to see why he didn't. They would have furthered the wrong narrative of, of this all being based on merit, human merit. I've had the privilege of knowing one educated scientist. He was actually a physicist uh, uh, who I thought was absolutely outstanding in his field, outstanding in many other ways. He knew and he, he knew the Lord. He loved the Lord. He loved the Lord tremendously. But that's... That's kind of rare. Uh, he, the Lord did not call the kind of people that you'd think that he'd, he'd call. When you were a kid and you decided to play baseball, you didn't choose the worst player. You chose the best to be on your team. Always. I mean, that's, that's all we, we've known our lives. You know, to choose the best. But God didn't do that, folks. He did not do that. And we're seeing these truths unfold in the context of, of a people that were far, far from what we today would call righteous, holy, sanctified. But they were said to be exactly that. Folks, are you getting it? You're likely not wise. You're likely. You're not mighty. Maybe a few of you are. Or noble. But even if you are, you're the filth and the off-scouring of the world system. But we are redeemed. We're God's family. And it's not a rotten family. as we saw in 1 John. It is in the eyes of the academic and the, and the scientific system, the philosophical system, and, and even the theological system, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let that pass by us here, but this is the context. We are not what, what, uh, what they want to be, but we are God's children. God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and I would probably run away over my time. I love you all. I truly do. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the access that we have by grace just to approach boldly with confidence your face to seek after you, your throne of grace. I ask that you would filter out all of that, which is not true. Seal to our hearts that which, it, which is true. I ask in Christ's name, amen. And amen. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.